Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it is seven o'clock um, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the July meeting of the council, uh, the Chelmsford City Council Cabinet. It doesn't feel like July and the weather doesn't look like July, but um, there we go. Um, uh, we are all getting used to dealing with um, new ways of working and um, there are 20, at least 29 people taking part in this meeting and it is being recorded and live streamed on our website. And so uh, everyone should bear that in mind when they're speaking. Um, if there are any technical difficulties, which may sometimes occur during the meeting, um, then if the live feed breaks, then I will have to adjourn the meeting. Um, hopefully we can fix that. Hopefully we won't have any such problems. We're just we're just getting used to the to this way of doing business now. Um, as usual, just to remind you, um, if you're not taking part in the meeting, please turn off your video and your audio. Um, please use uh, the chat box, which I'm just bringing up to make my make sure I've got can see it. Please use the chat box um, to indicate that you want to speak, and with an H. And if you could also put the item number uh, so that we're clear about which item you're trying to speak on. And of course, yeah, please address your any contributions through me and turn on your video. Usually turn on your video first and then your audio um, when you're called to speak. Um, as usual, any councillor with an interest in an item should declare it and not take part in the meeting. And um, when we come to uh, the voting on any of the recommendations, um, I will ask people to indicate. So, um, OK, so that's the sort of preparatory uh, start to the meeting. And the first item on the agenda, first formal item, um, item one is attendance and apologies. So, Mr Mayfield. Yes, thank you, Chair. The um, members showing present at the meeting at the moment uh, are the Cabinet members, uh, yourself, Councillor Stephen Bromson, uh, Marie Goldman, Chris Davidson and Rose Moore. The Cabinet deputies, Martin Bracken, uh, Natasha Dudley and Chloe Tron. And the opposition spokespersons, uh, Kevin Bentley, Paul Clark, Wendy Dayden, Sue Dobson, John Galley, Richard Highland, Bob Massey, Ian Roberts, Malcolm Sismi, Mike Steele, Malcolm Watson and Roy Whitehead. There are a number of officers present, uh, among them uh, Nick Eveley, the Chief Executive, Lorraine Brown, the Legal and Democratic Services Manager, Amanda Zafahi, uh, Director of Financial Services, and Phil Reeves, the Accountancy Services Manager. And there are other officers present should they uh, be called upon to speak. Um, I've had one apology for absence, which is from the Cabinet Deputy, Councillor Anne Davidson. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, as Councillor Bentley has pointed out in the chat, he's Keith Bentley <laughs> rather than Kevin. Uh, it's a different Bentley. Um, so, um, OK, thank you. Uh, moving on, um, if any, item two, anybody got any declarations of interest, please indicate. I assume not. Um, Item three is the minutes of the 2nd of June. Are you happy that they are a correct record? Cabinet members, is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, right, so moving on to item four, uh, public questions, um, which we invite to be submitted in advance of the meeting. And um, we have three uh, questions that have been submitted and I think Mr Mayfield you're going to read those out I suggest if we do number one and then probably I mean, if we take two and three together thank you yes thank you chairman and uh, my apologies uh, to Councillor Bentley sorry about that I'm always getting too confused um, yes we've had three questions uh, all relate to the greener and safer Chelmsford port portfolio um, the first is from Chloe Ahmed and reads the media have reported that the City Council has fined the A Canteen for displaying A boards to advise customers of the new rules and to social distance. 
Whilst it is accepted that the City Council has a policy of clearing pavements of advertising matter, is the Cabinet member not aware that the Government advised councils to relax such rules to allow businesses to operate in the current climate? At a time when it is essential for businesses to survive, will the administration reconsider the fine so as to avoid the impression that it is anti-business? Thank you. Yes, Councillor Moore. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Mayfield, for reading the question. Thank you for your question, Ms Ahmed. Chelmsford City Council has been working very hard to support businesses throughout this crisis. We swiftly transferred £32 million pounds worth of grants into a business's bank accounts, providing vital funding for those businesses that qualified under the government's criteria. We've already had two rounds of discretionary grants, which helped many businesses missed by the government's original scheme. And the application process for the current round of discretionary grants is open until next Sunday, the 12th of July. The Council has also supported market traders so that those selling essentials have been able to do so throughout lockdown. With regard to your specific question on A boards, over the last few years, Chelmsford City Council and many others around the country have listened to concerns raised by residents who are partially sighted or have mobility issues and have brought in restrictions on the displaying of such boards in busy shopping areas. This is to ensure that some of our more vulnerable residents can shop safely without fear of tripping over hazards. You've rightly accepted that the City Council has a policy of clearing pavements of advertising matters such as this, so you will, I'm sure, understand the reason for doing so. A boards are prohibited in the city centre to enable people with a visual disability or physical impairment to safely negotiate the city centre and the blocking of a public highway forcing pedestrians into a designated cycle path as was the case in this case is not something that the council can support. You asked, is the cabinet member not aware that the government advised councils to relax such rules to allow businesses to operate in the current climate? Well, the government has eased some planning and licensing restrictions to make it easier for some food and drink businesses to facilitate social distancing requirements whilst trading. However, the easing of these restrictions does not apply to A boards and does not allow the inappropriate blocking of the public highway or footpaths for obvious safety reasons. You also asked whether the administration would reconsider the fine. Well, in dealing with breaches of the public spaces protection order, such as the placement of A boards outside the premises, a fixed penalty notice may be issued as an alternative to prosecution. We always advise or offer encouragement in the first instance with an informal warning to follow if the advice isn't followed. And if businesses do not then comply, we can either issue an FPN or fixed penalty notice or proceed to prosecution as appropriate. If an individual or business on whom the fixed penalty no notice is served does not agree with that action, they can refuse to pay the penalty notice and then the offence of breaching the public spaces protection order will be dealt with in the magistrate's court. The council was very pleased to see recently that A Canteen has now stated on social media that they were pleased to be working with us to promote both their businesses and social distancing. Ms Ahmed, we recognise that the past few months have been extremely challenging for local business and I hope I've been able to detail this evening how the administration has worked closely with officers and businesses to actively support this offering advice on how to secure grants and loans through a recovery survey of over 400 chumps of businesses, enabling us to identify their needs and assist them in accessing vital training to move more of their businesses online. We also access European funding, so through the BID, the Business Improvement District, have been able to finance street ambassadors to assist the public and signage to encourage social distancing for the reopening of our high street. We are very proud too of Chelmsford's purple flag status. This accreditation is awarded to town and cities centres in the UK that 
meet or surpass standards of excellence in managing the nighttime economy. So as the hospitality sector sees a very welcome return, we are also continuing to provide safe and accessible city centre spaces into the evenings with the resumption of the SOS bus and of our street pastors, keeping visitors safe and our nighttime economy thriving. Thank you again for your question, and I hope this has provided you with the answer you need. Um, thank you for that one. Um, if we can now move on to the other two, as, uh, and so if Mr Mayfield could read both of those out as they're on the same subject. Thanks. Yes, certainly, Chair. Uh, the first is from Scott Wilson. Um, it reads, in January of this year, the City Council planted 1,000 trees alongside Creekview Road in South Wooden Ferries, quote, forming a new woodland for all to enjoy, end quote. Can the cabinet member responsible give an update on this project? How many trees have been planted and how many have taken and are growing and how and when the project is expected to become the quote, new woodland which all can enjoy, end quote. The second question is from Susan Sullivan on the same subject. I have been concerned to see the deplorable condition of Creek View Green in South Wooden Ferries. This once beautiful space has been ruined, hardly an environmental success. I would like to know how many rate, how much ratepayers' money was spent on the initial preparation and planting, how many trees were planted at Creek View Green, how many have died, what plans are in place to replant the area or return it to Greensward, and at what cost? Also, in view of the Council's stated ambitions for tree planting across Chelmsford, what actions are being taken to ensure this sorry situation does not happen elsewhere? That's the question, Mr Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Councillor Moore. Many thanks, Chair. Many thanks, Mr Mayfield. I would like to turn to Scott Wilson's question first. It may well answer um, elements of Ms Sullivan's question as well but um, I will answer um, hopefully comprehensively. Scott, thank you very much for your questions. You asked how many trees have been planted. 2,660 whips were planted between November 2019 and February 2020 on the former hay meadow um, at Creekview Green. You asked how many have taken and are growing, and this is also a question that was raised by Susan Sullivan. Well, some tree species such as pine and oaks have done better than others at Creekview Green, but overall we estimate that 65% of whips are establishing well. Some losses are always expected, and whilst the losses of 35% are high, these should be seen in the context of no perceivable rainfall in April, May and most of June of this year, which made for some very harsh growing conditions. That is the direct cause of the losses. It is not possible to water whips individually due to the scale and accessibility of planted areas, so establishing the whips does depend on natural precipitation. You also ask how and when is the project expected to become the quote new woodland which all can enjoy. And Susan Sullivan would also like to know what plans are in place to replant the area or return it to Greensward and at what cost. Well, forming a new woodland doesn't happen overnight, of course, it is a lengthy process. But we do see the evolving landscape over time. Initially, a temporary weed suppressant supplied and preparation of the new planting areas alongside mulching with natural bark chippings to give the whips the best chance to establish. And at Creek View Green, the after effects of that treatment can still be seen at present, um, not least because of the lack of rainfall that we've had to wash through. But over the coming weeks, and especially following periods of rainfall, new growth will emerge. I can offer reassurance that herbal vegetation and areas of meadow grass will return. At Creekview Green and other planting sites, there's also the opportunity to introduce different wildflower zones woven into the emerging woodland landscape by overseeding, particularly in those challenging bare and stony areas that are more suited to wildflower germination. This will not only look beautiful as the years go by, but also vitally will continue to boost biodiversity. 
Furthermore, in creating new woodland with the help of volunteers from our local communities, we all have the chance to enjoy the active process of planting and nurturing new habitat. Everyone can contribute and enjoy being part of that now. We choose a mix of native tree species best suited to each area of planting. And as with any other establishing woodland scheme, we're now seeing some naturally occurring grass and wildflower growth too, which is good. It's by no means overwhelming newly planted whips, but still provides habitat for our invertebrates and pollinators as the land develops. Maintenance is ongoing, but we have a naturalistic approach. This is natural woodland rather than manicured parkland. We seek to top the mulch up in autumn, and we would also plan routine gapping up or filling in of areas that have died back naturally. We replant as necessary. So establishing a woodland takes time and patience, but the biodiversity gain can be seen within a couple of seasons as pollinators and then bird species begin to take up residence. The landscape will soften and become more dynamic, shifting with the seasons tree canopy cover will increase and vital habitat will be created. Just a final point to you, Scott. Planting schemes such as those in Southwood and Ferrers also address flood risk. We only have to look at the projections for coastal flooding in the coming decades to acknowledge the urgent need to build flood resilience into our landscapes now. If I may come to Susan Sullivan's specific questions, she mentioned how concerned she was to see the deplorable condition of Creekview Green. We have seen extremes of weather in 2020, as I'm sure you know, the wettest February on record since the 1840s, and then exceptionally warm and dry conditions since April. This has meant challenging conditions for all of the newly planted areas across Chelmsford and South Wooden. A site assessment took place on Monday the 6th of July following reports over the weekend of residents' concerns. And the officer established that the tree plantation in Creekview does indeed look like any other establishing tree plantation just now, with some naturally occurring grass and wildflower growth, not dissimilar in look from a hay meadow, but by no means overwhelming those newly planted whips. All whips were planted and mulched individually, Mulch will be topped up in autumn when routine gapping up or replanting when necessary will be arranged. And establishing woodland, as I've said, is not a one-off planting occasion. We are expecting to gap up and replant some areas for the first two or three seasons and will deliver aftercare as required, as described, as described before. This does not mean eradicating naturally occurring herbal or hay meadow undergrowth. You ask how much rate payers' money was spent on the initial preparation and planting. The cost of woodland whips, the young trees for Creekview, in total was £2,557, and £1,600 was required for the fencing. It is anticipating that gapping up and replanting activities will require a further £884 in, in whips, which is a grand total of £5,041. Within the scheme, most of the initial planting is undertaken by volunteers who are supported by existing council employees at community planting events. So any costs involved are generally tree stock and materials required for fencing off areas vulnerable to footfall, trampling and disturbance. As this has been a subject close to many hearts in Southwood and Ferris, I just wanted to remind those residents and the wider public of our uh, proposals and, and how our mass greening um, planting programme contributes to our climate and ecological emergency goals. Urban trees and woodland are increasingly recognised as providing a diverse range of environmental and quality of life benefits. These are important in tackling the current climate emergency too. They increase biodiversity of an area. They improve the water holding capacity of an area and help to mitigate flood risk. They provide shade and improve heat absorption during periods of hot weather. They reduce air pollution and improve air quality. They help to manage and offset carbon emissions and they create a better quality of life and environment to provide better mental and physical health 
benefits for all. A key action in our Chelmsford Our Plan and the Climate and Ecological Declaration is to undertake a greening programme to significantly increase the amount of woodland and the proportion of tree cover in Chelmsford and the wider district through a sustained 10 year mass tree planting campaign. And this programme aims to plant one tree for every resident and at least three new trees planted for every dwelling built. This will increase tree cover to at least 20% in the area. The average is 16% currently, and we were at 13.8% this time last year. We would do this by planting 175,000 additional trees, creating an additional 84 hectares of woodland and tree cover, and we will use native species. The planting and aftercare is supported by existing council staff, who will work alongside volunteers through organisational and company volunteering days, also funded by donations from those companies, existing volunteering groups and activities, schools and colleges and community tree planting days. The scheme will contribute greatly to our goal of making the council's activities net zero carbon by 2030 and brings with it all of the positive benefits of a greener and and more beautiful landscape. Thank you very much again for your questions and to those residents of South Woodham who have contacted us. Thank you, Mr Mayfield. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's it for public questions, uh, item four. So thank you for that. Um, so we'll now uh, move on. Um, item five is, is questions uh, from councillors. Um, and I think first up is Councillor Massey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, um, and uh, thank you for that comprehensive response to uh, from Councillor Moore. I, I have a couple of follow up questions from that. Um, you won't be surprised to learn. Um, the first question is, has the cabinet member actually visited the site um, to uh, to examine it? Uh, if not, I would welcome a joint socially distanced visit to count those remaining 1700 trees. At least I don't think it will take too long. Um, and secondly, a major pipeline was laid in, the, in that vicinity a few years ago. Um, and I understand that Essex and Suffolk Water uh, expected to be consulted prior to any planting. Um, some of the trees that I've seen over there that appear to have survived are oaks. And I'm wondering if the roots on the oaks may jeopardize that new pipeline. Um, and I wonder if uh, Essex and Suffolk Water were consulted. Thank you. Councillor Moore, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Um, I, I have visited the area previous to the recent um, correspondence, and indeed I was involved in planting the area um, on two occasions in December and February. Unfortunately, on a journey to view Creekview um, on Monday, uh, unfortunately our car windscreen smashed on the A130, and so um, although not completely disintegrated, we had to bring it home and I didn't manage to get there. But very um, happy to say that Councillor Marie Goldman kindly paid a visit and took some videos at the area and she shared those with me. Um, and I could see that the um, the parched area um, where the glyphosate has obviously still remained and is, is keeping the weeds suppressed um, it does look rather stark. But I have seen uh, considerable amounts of growth from the young stems of the whips. Um, and I can only hope that the rainfall that we're seeing this evening um, may continue for a few more days um, because every time rain falls, it washes through and will encourage new growth. Um, I would be very happy to visit the site with you, Councillor Massey, and indeed other officers. Um, and so perhaps we could arrange uh, a date suitable for you. Um, and with regard to Essex and Suffolk water, um, the issue of the water main has been taken into account here. Um, the City Council had not received any correspondence from Essex and Suffolk Water suggesting that there was an issue. The planting of deep rooting trees such as oak, um, as you mentioned, was avoided as much as possible on the planting days. Um, although being community events, inevitably someone may have picked up a bundle and had a spare oak and gone to the area that we had designated that no oak should be planted. Um, if this is the case and the oaks come into leaf, we can instantly see that they are oak. They will obviously be removed from the site anywhere near the water main um, and we will um, obviously replant them as necessary elsewhere. 
I hope that helps to go some way to answer your questions. OK, uh, Councillor Massey. Um, Thank I, you. I, I look forward to an invitation to go over there. Um, I'm, I'm nearby, so that shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Me too. Good. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Roberts, was was your indication on this topic or something else? It was on something else. OK. Um, Councillor Sismi, were you on this topic or something else? No, not Councillor Sismi. OK. Oh, yes, there you are. Um, I said I'll be happy to join. It's on this topic. I'll be happy to join uh, Councillor Moore and Councillor Massey on the uh, visit to this site. OK, yep, yeah, good. I'm sure we can arrange that. Um, one thing we can't do is arrange the weather. As I said at the top of the meeting, it doesn't really feel like July at the moment. Um, right, OK. Um, Councillor Whitehead was for were, were you a question or were you on item six? I was just trying to give apologies, Chairman, uh, okay. which I put onto the screen for you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, apologies from Councillor Potter and Raven, which gives me the opportunity to say that I've just had a text from Councillor McCrory and his uh, internet connection doesn't appear to be working. So apologies from uh, Councillor McCrory as well. OK, so I think. Um, we're, we're back to uh, Councillor Roberts then. Did you? What was your question? It was only re related to uh, an item from the last meeting. I, I, I just wonder whether we've got a date when the consultations for the planning of obligations and the making spaces SPD would be uh, starting. I haven't seen anything since the meeting that it was authorised to go for consultation. So either I've missed it or I've, it hasn't started yet. Uh, right, I'm just. The mic's not here. <laughs> no, I was going to say, without Councillor McCrory, um, I Can will make sure. Have a answer yeah. after the meeting. Yeah, we will definitely do that. Um, we will we will note that down and make sure that you get an answer. That's no problem. Um, right, okay. Um, I think uh, I'm just going to go back to uh, the yeah the 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 chat box. Um, I think. I think we're done now on questions, unless anybody jumps in now. OK, thank you. Um, right, so moving on to item six, we now have three financial reports, capital, treasury management and uh, medium term strategy. So, uh, Councillor Davison. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, 6.1 is the capital programme update and provisional outturn for last year. Uh, we approve a capital programme every year. As part of the budget uh, in January, February, uh, we set that uh, programme. And then once a year in the middle of the year, we have a report uh, on both how the previous year turned out uh, and an update on the current year. And that's what this uh, report is doing. Now, in terms of capital, there are two types. Uh, there's the asset replacement programme, which is the smaller items of equipment, and there's the uh, larger schemes, uh, the capital projects. So on the capital schemes to start with, Appendix 1 shows progress on those capital schemes. As regards the outturn for last year, um, that was almost £10 million below the original plan. Um, most of that uh, will be delivered in later years. There was a small reduction, about 3%. Uh, and the rest uh, is deferred into later years, which is obviously a help from a cash flow perspective. Um, the 2021 budget uh, is uh, slightly lower than previously projected as the costs are down by 168,000. Um, there's also been a reduction in the completed schemes of 180,000, which uh, clearly we welcome. So uh, I'm requesting that the cabinet approve uh, two schemes uh, that are additional um, or rather one scheme uh, was already there um, that's number 27 uh, which is the Highlands uh, toilet refurbishment that needs an extra 78,000 pounds to do the job properly uh, and in addition to that number 84 
uh, is a project we've already approved. The sill allocation of the capital has been approved, but we haven't actually approved going ahead and incorporating that into the capital budget. So I'm hoping that both of those things can be approved this evening. Uh, that will take the budgets, uh, the capital budgets in total to 144.7 million, and that's detailed in Appendix 1. I'm not going to go through Appendix 1, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, the, it, it may be worth noting, because I know there's an interest in this, uh, for the item at 6.3 on the agenda, uh, that £19 million of capital expenditure originally scheduled for 2021 has been pushed forward into later years, uh, which is obviously helpful from the perspective of funding the capital programme going forwards. Um, so uh, I'll ask Cabinet to uh, recommend uh, that Council uh, note this in relation to the capital schemes. As far as the asset replacement uh, programme is concerned, uh, the outturn for last year was 170,000 below budget. There was some re reduction in cost involved in that, um, but a significant rephasing into later years. Uh, the more we can uh, keep our assets going uh, for longer uh, and delay the need to replace them, the better as long as we can continue to deliver the service. Um, for 2021, the budget is reduced by uh, 900,000. That reflects uh, some extra of 100,000, which is detailed in Appendix 4, uh, and then a million plus of deferrals uh, where we're rephasing the expenditure. So I think at that point, I'm going to um, pause and see whether there are any questions. I can't see, I don't think anybody's indicated um, in the the meeting chat, so and I, I don't see any just waiting just in case anybody wants to jump in at this point, but um, no, I doesn't, doesn't seem that we have any questions on the capital programme. In that case, um, I will just ask that Cabinet approves um, the new scheme and cost increases, uh, item one in the paper, the proposed asset replacement programme for 2021 uh, and the increased costs and rephasing uh, as shown in the paper and that uh, we recommend to Council that the latest proposed budget uh, of 144 million uh, odd be noted uh, and those other items at two, three and four including the method of funding, uh, which I didn't mention, um, but which is set out in the uh, in, in paragraph five. So in the absence of any questions, I'd ask Council to approve uh, those points. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, agreed, everyone, I think. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. OK, let's move on um, to your 6.2. Right. Thank you. Uh, paper 6.2 is the Treasury Management Outturn Report um, the, for last year. Um, so this was discussed at the Treasury Management and Investment Subcommittee. Uh, uh, it's on the agenda tonight and it will be on the agenda again for full council in a fortnight's time. And I'm hoping that Cabinet will recommend this paper. Um, as I say, it has been through Treasury Management Subcommittee. Uh, the uh, the main point I think to note um, is um, that uh, the CCLA fund, the property fund that we have um, originally five million pounds uh, and now worth six point something million pounds invested in, has been debated previously. I uh, I can't honestly remember whether in cabinet or full council, but certainly one of those. Um, as of last year, the value had fallen by 200,000. There's a further fall this year, um, and the fund is now closed at the moment. We're expecting it to reopen again. Um, so the, the circumstances are less beneficial at the moment than they have been in the past. Um, nevertheless, when, um, when we invested uh, in this as a council, and when I say as a council, that was some years ago, I think it was 2014, um, when the previous administration approved investment in this. 
that was seen as being an investment with a three to five year horizon. Um, we still see it as a, a, an investment with that sort of horizon. Um, we have had very good income and capital growth. Um, over time, that's what we still expect. The state of the economy, of course, uh, which is generating the current circumstances, lockdown, coronavirus, um, means that we need to be vigilant. Um, and the Director of Financial Services um, will, of course, decide if it's appropriate to withdraw our investment. But as I understand it, she has no current intention to do so. Nevertheless, um, I'm sure that the Management of Taxes and Investment Subcommittee will want to look very carefully at how this is progressing. Um, I think that, though, uh, the question of, uh, of the, the status of the CCLA fund is the, is the main talking point on this paper. Beyond that, it's simply noting um, that this is um, what has happened with our management of, uh, of our Treasury assets over the year to 31st of March last year. Um, so I'm going to pause here again and uh, take questions because I think there are some this time. Oh, sorry, uh, perhaps not. Uh, there's a question on 6.3. So uh, back to you, Chair, to decide whether there are any questions for this one. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I don't think um, we have anybody, as you say. Um, so uh, is the Treasury Management Report agreed? Agreed. 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 Right. Okay, then 6.3. OK, 6.3, I can imagine it is the one uh, that uh, probably has significantly uh, more um, uh, interest. This is a paper that addresses the most important issue that the City Council faces currently, frankly. We have a forecast here which shows a serious funding challenge. Um, COVID-19 has caused major impacts across the UK economy. Um, and we are not immune. Uh, the purpose tonight is to agree the strategy that the Cabinet will recommend to full Council in a fortnight. Um, it's, it's also important to bear in mind that there are always uncertainties to be navigated and a budget gap to be closed when we look uh, in July at the, uh, at the medium term uh, financial strategy. And the strategy is there to guide our approach. This year, though, the uncertainty is far greater. The budget gap is potentially far larger than normal. Um, so I think we need particular caution in interpreting the numbers. The numbers set out in this paper are going to change. Um, if I can just say a few words on the financial context, COVID-19 and lockdown have, as I say, had a very serious impact on our finances. Um, We've provided extra support for residents in response to COVID-19, and that creates extra costs. Uh, we set up a community hub. We've taken rough sleepers off the streets. We've administered grant schemes, uh, as Councillor Moore was uh, mentioning. We've maintained essential services, uh, but at some additional cost. It is, though, the reduced income that's had the most impact on the finances. 70% of services are funded by income from car parks, leisure centres, theatres, events at Highlands, income from uh, our cash and land investments. Uh, and those, um, those income sources are all down. Um, and we released a video last month to explain this, forecasting an £8.6 million shortfall for this year. Um, uh, and that, that uh, that forecast is already out of date as the um, as the paper uh, in front of us tonight shows. One critical factor is the level of government financial support for local government. Uh, and the government finally announced a further package of support last week. Uh, we don't have the details yet, um, but I expect that the chance that Chelmsford's allocation from that um, will be very welcome and it will go some way towards delivering the funding that we need. But whatever the details, once they become available, it's already clear that it will fall far short of closing the gap that's caused by COVID-19. So I think from my perspective, it's one cheer for the government at best, no more than that. 
Um, as I say, the objective is to focus on um, on the strategy. So how are we responding? Um, well, first of all, responding to what? Forecasting that the council's finances over the next five years is almost impossible in current circumstances. As I've said, the video uh, set out one figure. Uh, that's been superseded. Uh, the figure we have tonight, the 9.5 million, will change again. But despite these difficulties, we still need to make plans to mitigate the financial risk to the council. What we've done in the paper is try to set out a range of possible scenarios showing the low, medium and high shortfalls, uh, particularly as we go into years beyond uh, 2021, which is the period that uh, this uh, medium term financial forecast and strategy focus on. Um, and the chart in the papers at paragraph 2.6 I hope illustrates uh, the, the, the range of, of the challenge that we face. Um, now, our initial response to COVID-19 is to use our available reserves. Um, as the effect uh, is so large, we believe we need to top up the reserves by reallocating the contributions to uh, the contributions to capital that we had originally budgeted. So subject to hearing the details of the latest government funding, uh, which may uh, cause a, uh, a rethink to some extent, we propose to remove from the revenue budgets for 2019-20 and 2021 uh, those items. Um, that seems to be the only way to ensure that the reserves are sufficient to respond to the COVID-19 shock. That, though, has a lasting effect on our revenue budgets which will need to pick up uh, the MRP, the uh, minimum revenue provision, which is the cost of replacing the capital um, that, that we are um, using. So the revenue we, we uh, reallocate uh, from last year and this will come back as revenue cost over future years. The other effect of a generally worsened outlook is that we will deplete our cash more than originally forecast. And that, of course, requires increased internal borrowing and reduces income from investments. And I know that's uh, a, a, a point on which uh, members have particular concern. So the strategic response to the challenges I've just set out requires a series of measures to ensure that we're able to prepare a balanced budget for 21, 22 and later years. These measures are set out in Section 8 of the paper, and I won't read them out. Um, We've already begun taking the short term measures as uh, set out at uh, paragraph 8.2, uh, and we've also refreshed and strengthened the existing strategy. It's worth noting, though, uh, as I say, that um, once we understand and have more clarity around the government funding, uh, we may wish to flex the amount of the top up of reserves. So in summary, there's a very significant financial challenge for this council. The forecast revenue gap for next year set out in the paper is uh, the largest the council has seen for many years and probably the largest ever. A significant gap will remain even after the extra funding the government has announced. The size of that gap remains uncertain uh, and the best forecasts today will inevitably prove wrong. So what we need is a strategy to enable us to navigate through these uncertainties and deliver a balanced budget for 21-22 in six months' time. And that's what this paper sets out. Uh, so at this point, I'll pause to ask questions uh, and then I'll be coming back uh, to invite Cabinet to, uh, to reach a decision. But perhaps I can come back to that later. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so Councillor Watson. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, is my microphone working properly? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. That's okay. fine. That's brilliant. Good. Thank you very much indeed. We, we, we can't actually see. We can only see your shoulder, Malcolm. Oh, <laughs> oh there we go. <laughs> oh, OK, sorry. Oh, look. That's we, all right. We can see you now. That's OK, good. Um, thank you. Well, we, we appreciate the difficulties um, in preparing uh, this report, given the current uh, difficult circumstances the Council faces. But we do support in, in the, the general financial strategy as set out in this, in this report. Uh, additionally, I would like to thank Councillor Davidson and Mr Reeves for their further clarification of, of points that we had raised, which resulted in the additional paper which was circulated um, by uh, uh, Amanda yesterday. 
Uh, just one further uh, point of clarification I would ask Councillor Davidson is that the he mentioned briefly the MRP charge, which I understand does include an element of interest. Um, I think it also includes an, an element of uh, capital rep um, uh, repayment, um, but not necessarily over the life of the of the asset being acquired. I, is that correct? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, and, and is that it for um, Councillor Watson? Yes, it was. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, Councillor Davison. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for your uh, support, Councillor Watson. Uh, it is appreciated. Um, just for the benefit of, uh, of anybody who uh, is wondering what the additional paper is, it was an explanation of internal borrowing um, uh, and sets out the costs in terms of uh, the MRP uh, and the reduction in interest, which is uh, which I mentioned in my introductory remarks. So I don't think you've missed anything. Um, yeah, the the MRP, strictly speaking, the MRP uh, does not have an interest uh, element to it. The MRP is a calculation uh, of the amount of capital each year uh, that needs uh, to flow back through the uh, the revenue account in order to replenish uh, the capital over the life of the asset. Um, the, the life of the asset is not necessarily the same as the life of the borrowing. So, for example, if we were to buy an asset uh, with a 10-year life using a two-year loan, we wouldn't need the MRP to write it off over two years. We could write it off over 10 years um, because the, the borrowing can be refinanced after two years. But clearly, the life of the asset is the life of the asset. So the MRP would write off uh, the, uh, the asset over that, uh, the period of its life. Um, and uh, as I understand it, there are different ways in which that can be done. Um, if you spent, uh, if it was a 10 million pound asset over 10 years, uh, then that uh, might in simple terms be a million pounds a year, but there might be ways of doing it in the, similar to a repayment mortgage, where you repay a smaller amount of, uh, of the capital in the earlier years uh, and the amount builds up over time. So the, there are um, technicalities to the way this works uh, that Mr Reeves will be able to explain far better than I am. In terms of the interest effect, um, the interest effect comes uh, from from uh, the, uh, the, the, the broader impact of uh, the cash balances on the council. So if we start off with what we were originally expecting for 2021 to be our budget, if we'd have the same income as expected and the same expenditure, then that would have led to capital, uh, uh, sorry, that, that would have led to uh, cash flowing in and out and would have left us with uh, balances that are quite difficult to predict. But broadly speaking, you can give an indication of how much cash you'd have available. And clearly, investing that cash, uh, as we, as I mentioned in the previous paper uh, on Treasury management, generates an income. If it turns out that more cash has gone out and less cash has come in, that has an impact um, that leads to a reduction in the income. I don't think uh, there is, uh, in strictness, uh, an interest item um, that, that is directly part of the MRP. But nevertheless, the, the fact that interest is, um, uh, the fact that you are um, allocating uh, your capital in a particular way and the cash will no longer be available, means that there is there is uh, also a reduction in the interest. But I think uh, the paper makes the point that the interest impact is going to be very small given rates of interest at the moment. Uh, and it's the uh, the replenishment of the capital, the, the MRP charge, uh, that will have a bigger impact on the revenue budget. I hope that uh, explains the position. And I hope that uh, Mr. Reeves isn't about to leap in and tell me I've got that wrong. Uh, I, I, will, I will fess up and write to you if I have, but I, but I think that's the correct understanding. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that explanation. Um, I don't think we have any other questions unless anybody wants to jump in at this point. 
I'll just pause for a moment. And um, Councillor Whitehead, did you want to come in? Yep, thank you. Only, only very, very briefly um, to endorse uh, what was being said by Councillor Watson. Uh, it's not a, a situation where uh, we can do other than, than plan ahead on the best knowledge available. Uh, I, I didn't detect the Chancellor offering us lots of money this afternoon, um, but perhaps it's in the small print that's going to reach you tomorrow. Uh, but um, we will have to wait to see. But otherwise, no, we are doing the best we can, and, and, and thank you for doing all of that. Uh, we clearly will have to look in the future at the way that the Council operates and what we can do and what we can't do. But to speculate now would be foolish uh, and, and, and quite wrong to do that. We've got a chance of speaking more generally in, in a few weeks' time at Council. But again, it is not our job uh, to raise difficult questions that are impossible to answer. That's, that's political, and, and we don't wish to be like that. Uh, we wish to see our residents served well. They are being served well at the moment, and I'm happy to uh, say we get lots of nice comments from, from residents still. Um, my dustbins were collected today on time and, and so on. So that uh, good luck to Councillor Davison. Thank you for sending the explanatory um, paper that, that we asked for. Uh, and, and I think that the whole report is one that uh, needs careful thought, really, uh, and presumably will get repeated to the extent that it, it will appear again um, a, a council, probably unamended, which is something you'll like to know, I know. But uh, but no, no, thank you to him, thank you to Phil Reeves and the team, uh, and to Amanda. Uh, we realise the difficulties you have, uh, and we have our fingers in the air, uh, as do you. Uh, and uh, I'm confident that we will lobby our members of parliament to make sure that Chelmsford gets its just desserts. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for your for your support. Um, and yes, I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, the officers who've worked really hard on not I mean on the paper, but on the on the work that underlies all of it. Um, so thank you to them. Also, thank you to Councillor Davison, who's um, put a lot of work into this himself. Um, and um, I think. The answers have shown that he's uh, on on top of his brief. So, uh, um, and as as you said, Councillor Whitehead, um, you know, it, we all live in live in hope, but we're, our hopes are frequently dashed by government. Um, they did promise at the start of the crisis that we sh that councils should step up and do whatever was required to meet the demands of the crisis. So we and every other council did step up. Uh, they said they would support us, and they haven't completely supported all our costs, let alone our lost income. Um, so, um, uh, and this isn't actually a, a partisan point. I think councils of all colours um, have said that, you know, the government needs to uh, recognise uh, that local councils have stepped up, they have delivered on behalf of their residents and uh, have got on with the important job of looking after our residents. Um, and uh, there are anomalies where uh, businesses have had large uh, rate refunds, business rate refunds, and local councils haven't. And that, that's one area where we in particular have lost out. And I thank you to the two opposition group leaders for lending their support to a letter that we are sending to the minister um, requesting action on that business rates subject, because um, that's quite a significant loss to us on top uh, compared to local businesses. Um, so thank you for Thank you for the questions and thank you for your support. Um, is that paper agreed, members of the cabinet? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, well, okay, uh, Chair, I was hoping to to oh. come back. I was living in hope for a while of, <laughs> of coming uh, back okay. in. I, I just wanted to uh, add my uh, thanks um, to uh, Councillor Whitehead um, uh, and his team uh, for. Uh, it is very helpful to have support. Uh, and Councillor uh, Clark and uh, and the opposition group, um, but also in particular um, to uh, Mandy Fay um, and to Phil Reeves and his excellent team. Um, as I said at the start, this is a serious uh, challenge. This is a, a, a bigger gap uh, than uh, it, I, I would have wished to be talking about, but I'm confident that we've got the right strategy uh, and um, therefore what uh, I'm asking for is that we note the forecast, we delegate to the Director of Financial Services the authority to update the paper, and Councillor Whitehead uh, was thinking that maybe it doesn't need that, but if we get 
a better understanding of last week's announcement, then it may uh, be updated uh, and that we make, make the recommendations to council as set out in the paper. So thank you. Sorry to go on at length. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you. I think we've, that's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, you. Great. That's good. Right. Well, I think we're, we're nearly there. Uh, there isn't any urgent business. Um, Mr Mayfield, just remind us what's reporting to Council. Yes, Chair. The uh, three reports, uh, three finance reports at item six, all, all will be going on to Council on the 22nd of July. Right. Thank you very much. Um, OK, thank you. I just wanted to one one final thing. Um, the Cabinet um, will have a question time um, online um, on our website on uh, Tuesday the 21st, so the day before full Council, um, which uh, we hope will be attended by more people than maybe than came to our previous one, which was 6,000 people, so that was good. Um, and members of the public are invited to submit their questions in advance um, or in the chat box, it will be on Facebook Live. Um, and so uh, we hope to see the public taking part in that. Um, we've certainly uh, welcomed the fact as uh, this administration, we're really keen or pleased to see that we're online now and actually able to involve uh, more people um, at, this, at this time. And it saves people having to come to meetings in the council chamber. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone for their uh, for their attendance this evening. Thank you for your questions and um, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, Chairman. Thank you.